watching Inside the Gillivers, talking all things Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. Brought to you by the Royal Bobbles Collection at Bobbleheads.com. For all your favorite characters from the Gillivers, shop the Royal Bobbles Collection at Bobbleheads.com. Also brought to you by Rode Microphones, the official microphone supplier of Inside the Gillivers. See their entire lineup today at Rode.com. Now, please welcome your host, Eric Broadbent. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Season 3, Episode 4 of Inside the Gilliverse, where we talk all things Breaking Bad, El Camino, Better Call Saul, and trying not to burp from Pepsi uh, before we go live. It's a pleasure to welcome back tonight's guest. His first time on Inside the Gilliverse. We had him here before on Rock Shop Live. You know him as Howard Hamlin, Hamlin from HHM, from Better Call Saul. The wonderfully talented Patrick Fabian. How are you, Patrick? I'm great. You almost burped, though. I could hear it. I, I know. Here. I did. I did off camera. I did. I was trying not to do that. We're here. Everything's working good. we got a good connection. We just had to juggle some Wi-Fi. I'm telling you, man, it is great to to have you back. We've come for full circle. Remember those days? It was Rock Shop Live, and now we've got this Gilliverse thing? Yeah, no, you know, I was, I was, I was thinking it's been, what, four years, maybe? Yeah. About, almost. You, yeah, almost. it's been a bit. It's been almost four years, and we basically got together. Because we uh, we connected with uh, with Rush, you know, and, uh, and I got to come on and just you know prog out with you and, and hear you play and all that stuff, and that was really great. And then, you know, it blew up, it blew up, and then of course Tom Schnauz came in and tried to you know horn in and take all the credit. I'm glad you kept him at bay for a while. But, he's uh, he's a know. diva. He's a diva. You should see his list of demands. I have like a rider for his food. And the lights have to be a certain color, you know, and and all this different stuff. But we are taking donations to get him some good Wi-Fi for his house. It's either that um, or... He compla- he, does he complain that his children do something to his Wi-Fi? I he, bet he does. Yeah, he always he passes the blame. I'm Just like he does, I'm sure, on set. I better not say too much because he might be watching, and I do want him to come back as a co-host. So, yeah, Tom, I'm just kidding, of course. I love you. I'll, bet that I'll be, definitely be in your next project. Honest to God. Please, please, please. <laughs> well, I think I think he's going to be a greeter at Walmart, from what he told me. That's because he's <laughs> done, right? That He's done with all this Gulliver stuff. There's nothing left to do. Well, you know what? It, 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 there is a bit of that. It's funny you say that because, you know, people are like, so what do you want to do next? I'm like, uh, what I just did, that's what I want to do next. Yeah. You know, so great working with those people. There is a bit of, oh, well, what is the next thing? How, how do you, how do you go from this to that? But that, you know, that can apply to anybody on any show in some respects, because you, you get together, you become a show family, you do something. If you're lucky, you get to run for a while. If you're lucky, you get to have people watch it. And we've been lucky in both those accounts. Um, but I have to say, you know, without a doubt, I, I don't know if I'm going to find those kind of suits out there again for me. Yeah. Honestly, God, I say to Jen Bryan, who's the wardrobe uh, designer, I was like, are you sure something can't come home with me? And she's like, you know, that's not the way it works anymore. Those days are gone. Although maybe she always said that to me. I don't know. Maybe Tom has all my suits. He's getting them altered right now. Well, I know he got a pillow one time from the set from a premiere or something. He snuck it home, but it's not, you're not the only one who's tried for some props. I know uh, Charles Baker, he wanted to have skinny Pete's uh, beanie. He wanted that really bad. And, you know, a lot of people, I, you know, Michael Mando, I'm sure would love to have that car. You know, they might miss the car, I think. Right. The car is definitely going to be missed without a doubt. And by the way, I, I at first I was like, "Ooh, I'd like the Jaguar." And uh, but the fact of the matter is, if you have been in a Jaguar that's about 20, 25 years old, it's not as uh, sweet as you think it is. Okay, it's how archaic it is. I mean, cars have have changed so much in the last like four or five years. If you got in that, you would be like, "Wow, this was luxury," and it <laughs> certainly was. But man, it's just shifted so much. Yeah, yeah. You might be lucky to get the license plate, maybe, right? If you're lucky. Namaste. Yeah, there you you go. I want to thank you as well, too, before we get into the show, too, for you were one of uh, several people that was very kind and sent us that happy birthday uh, montage for Vince. He did see all the messages, uh, the videos, and he was very touched by them. So that was uh, that was pretty cool. And I really appreciate it. It was nice spending. You had your kids working with you as well, too. And for those who haven't seen that, go check the show uh, with Tom and Betsy. Um, uh, it, it's uh, really, really fun. And there's video messages from everybody wishing Vince a happy birthday. It was his birthday that night. So, and you were telling me off off camera a little bit. You did you have a chance to work with Vince a bit uh, this season? Uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I, we were saying about the idea that there was one season where I think he directed twice, and maybe he wrote or co-wrote with Peter Gould an episode or two. 
And, um, and I just, I, I wasn't in them. And, but he would see me like in the hallways out in Albuquerque and he'd stop me always, always such a gentleman. He's like, Oh, Patrick, I'm like, gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry that I, you know, I, I wish I could direct you in this one. They just, there, there wasn't any room for Howard at this time. And, you know, in my mind, you know, I said the nice, I'm like, don't worry about it. It's great. I'm sorry we missed each other either. Um, but, uh, but the truth is I was like, well, you're in charge. You could tell those writers to, you know, I did not say that, but I did get to, <laughs> and that's great. That's good. That's good. It's wonderful. Great, great man to work with. I'm sure. Right. Eh? Yeah. You know, um, I, I think I've told the story before. I'll tell it one more time. First day of work. I'm with Ray Seahorn. We're, we're at the conference table. Uh, the, Saul comes in with the network speech, you know, um, Anyways, we're there. It's the first day of work for me. And there's three cameras coming down the, the, the rail on me. And, uh, and I'm getting a little nervous. All of a sudden, I'm like, ha, ha. And we do our first take. And then Vince comes down and walks down the table. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm getting fired. Oh, this is where he comes up. And he goes, I'm sorry, we've made a mistake. We've cast the wrong person. And uh, you're going to go home. And I'm thinking, who I'm going to call first. And it's going to be okay. I'll probably work again. I'm going through all this actor nonsense. The good news is, Seahorn is going through the exact same thing. Vince comes down the table and he gets close to us. And then all of a sudden his vision goes to the table and there's a Danish. And he grabs the Danish and he moves it about an eighth of an inch of a turn. Then he takes his hand off it. He starts walking back up the table and then he turns around and he goes, oh, you guys were great. Let's do that again. And at that point I was like, oh, I'm either with a madman or I'm with a genius. Yeah. Uh, turn Maybe a little of both, but that was my first experience with him. And it really hasn't wavered from that. His eye of detail and the things that he's looking for in the show um, are why the show is the way it looks. I think, I think it's the, why, the, the reason it resonates because his attention to detail trickles down to everybody in the writer's room, to the props, to the sound, to the wardrobe, everything is thought about. And so therefore I think everything that you see in the frame is also thought about, which is what makes it so impactful for everybody. I, I've heard that story, like not that story, but that the story of Vince and his attention to detail many times. Um, I'm not sure if I told you this story last time you were on, but similar story shared by Mark Margolis, you know, who plays Hector Salamanca. Um, in Breaking Bad, in the face-off episode, so they're in, they're in um, um, Salamanca's room in the retirement home, right? And there were curtains that were blowing, and Vince came in and was just trying to position the curtains a certain way. And, and Mark had made a joke um, and it didn't go over the best, I think, at the moment. He made a joke saying, Vince, if this whole scene comes down to the position of those curtains, I think we're, we're going to be uh, we're screwed here. And, uh, and he just said, it's all in the details, Mark. It's all in the details. And just the curtains, right? So that was, that was a pretty cool moment. So you guys made the cut. The Danish was probably replaced by a fritter or something of sorts on the table. But, hey, that's good. So, you know, that, that, that we were just getting to know one another, you know, Ray and I as well. And so we had seen one another and talked, but we hadn't become, you know, the friends we are now today. But it certainly was a bonding moment because when the cameras turned around and started going on Bob, you know, we had time to sort of hang out. And I was able to confess, uh, like, hey, how about that Danish moment? This is what I was thinking. She was like, I was thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> and so Seahorn and I have been on the same page basically from day one. Well, you shared with me before, too, which I thought was hilarious, how you guys would text each other back and forth. Hey, did you get the, you get this one? You get the script? I'm still alive. Are you? You know, that kind of thing. That's hilarious as well. We've got several Super Chat questions coming in from our great team over here. This is actually from Jen Stevens, our moderator. She's saying, Patrick, uh, who was the best cook in the house you shared in Albuquerque, and what was everyone's favorite meal? P.S. Can I get a job at HHM? Uh, first of all, yes, you're hired, but work is at 8 a.m. And don't be late because we don't tolerate that, that kind of shit, okay? Okay. Got to be a Charlie Hustle. Um, second of all, in terms of cooking, well, you know, I think the intention was, isn't it great? We're all going to cook together. Uh, and instead, I think we became really good at ordering out and really good at as, as we were driving home, who wants to stop and pick up stuff? So I guess our best cook was Faux uh, 57. Um, we love that a lot. And then uh, also uh, El Cotara uh, Tacos on the corner of Central and Carlisle over in uh, Knob Hill. Uh, what was our, oh gosh, I'm blanking on the pizza place. I'll come back to it later, but it's on Central, right down near Artichoke. Um, Farina. Farina was a go-to. But I did cook a lot. The thing is, we would come into different shifts. You know, breakfast was a big thing that we did together and all that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, 
I'm a sugar, what's the word I'm looking for? Whore. So I would like eat, you know, uh, you know, uh, donuts. I would bring donuts home and eat them. And Ray's like, what are you doing bringing donuts home? And Bob also was like, I don't know if donuts are the best thing. But Bob, I think he's talked before about, he has a thing for ice cream though. Okay. He loved the ice cream and stuff like that. So every night around nine or 10 o'clock, if we were home around that time, all of a sudden we'd find ourselves gravitating to the kitchen with spoons. Yeah, okay. So ice cream was actually the best thing we cooked that we always liked and we were all good at it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you can go too wrong with that for sure. Uh, Peter Dyseth uh, shared a story with us in one of his scenes where there's one scene where, I mean, how many times has he hit the vending machine, right? He lives in the vending machine, but he's eating these uh, Fritos, I think it was, and he had to do the scene multiple times. And so every time I think if I got the story right, um, I got to turn the phone off. I thought I had it off. Um, uh, he'd have to have a fresh bag of Fritos. So it was taking them out proper or whatever. So at the end of the show, the, the shooting that day, he had this massive big bag. They sent it home with him. It was like a garbage bag full of Fritos. And I think he said, <laughs> if he saw another Frito, he would, you know, it'd be the last one he'd ever have. But uh, here's another question coming in. This is from Mike Fallout. Uh, Fallout it says, do you feel that Howard Hamlin is unfairly treated by Kim and Jimmy? Oh, well, of course I do. Absolutely. <laughs> I, you know, I, it, it is it is sort of the idea of like you always take your character's point of view. Uh, but in this case, I think I could sit outside of my character and make a case that Howard has really gone over and above to try and help out Jimmy and help out Kim and try and keep HHM afloat. And, you know, those McGill brothers have really been an albatross around his neck and his emotional and financial well-being. Um I just wish we could all be friends. Wouldn't it be great? I mean, we, we, we left the, at the end of season five, you know, we saw what they were talking about and Howard has sort of washed his hands of it all. So we'd like to think that there's just a nice, you know, amicable Dante. Is yeah. it Dante? No. What is it? Russians, Russians and Americans during the cold war. I don't know. Is that what it is? I don't know. I don't know. You're asking the wrong person. <laughs> Please, somebody chime in and correct me. You know what I'm talking about. We're two parties agree to have peace. Yes. Wow. You can tell. You can tell the writers wrote very well for Howard because I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, here is a here is a hypothetical scenario question. This one is from Maggie. I'm going to try to read this one. She says, if you, okay, so Patrick meets Howard Hamlin in person. Obviously, we can't do this. But if Patrick met Howard Hamlin in person, would you feel he's the type of person that you could go golfing with and have a few cold ones, or would you want him strictly as your lawyer? Mm, no, you know, uh, I, I can absolutely go golfing. I can get along with anybody. Patrick can get along with anybody. Awesome. I got along with Jonathan, along with Jonathan Banks, for God's sakes. But, <laughs> but I hear he's one of the easiest guys to get along with. Oh, he's a sweetheart. He just has a, a hard front. No, I would totally go golfing with Howard. The, the, the key would be if Howard would be willing to pick up the tab, and that would be interesting because – my nature would be like, oh, no, no, I got this one. Clearly, Howard should pick it up. And I, I'm, I'm curious if Howard would want to be the big shot to pick it up or if maybe he want to save a few bucks to find out where this relationship was going first. I could almost foresee Howard say, oh, you know, one of these. Oh, sh oh shoot, shoot. I think it's back at the club. The wallet. Can you get this one? You got this one, Patrick, right? I could almost see him doing that. He's got the money, but he's just like, you know what? I, I, I'm Howard Hamlin. Someone's going to pay my tab. Someone's going to pay my tab. He's used to that. So, yeah, I think so. Yeah. More questions coming in. It's good ones tonight. This is awesome. This is uh, from a fellow writer. Uh, this is Bob Rich. Uh, he runs the Vince Gilligan uh, fan group on Facebook. Uh, what were the most poignant and powerful scenes of Better Call Saul for you to perform in from the first five seasons? So that's a, that's a tough question, but some of the ones that might have been something that really stood out for you and maybe your character. Uh, you know, two come to mind immediately, and uh, I think they're both in season three. They're both in season four. I'm sorry, some of it all bleeds together. It's the bathroom scene uh, in the courthouse with Jimmy when I'm disheveled and, I, and my ties askew and, and all that stuff. And I'm in the midst of therapy. I'm reeling from the truck's death and trying to work through stuff. Broke at that point too, after that millions of check. Yeah. Yeah. That's a real, that's a real, uh, that's a real emotional thing. Also, you know, I think it was the, uh, oh, it was a uh, first episode um, season four, I think, where I go to, uh, Jimmy and Kim and, and confess that I think that I basically killed Chuck because of what I had done. Um, and it's funny because as an actor, I mean, if you watch the series, you know, uh, I don't have a lot of monologues really. Mm -hmm. I, 
but I've been on the receiving end of a lot of Chuck monologues, on a lot of Jimmy monologues, and actually on a lot of Kim monologues as well. Howard is not a, a, a verbose man when it comes to that, or he's had that chance. So that was a real challenge uh, right out of the gates to have sort of that long scene where I was rolling over all the reasons that I thought that I was responsible for Chuck's death. And, and you know, frankly, I was a little scared too, because I'm sitting there. And again, it's the actor brain. Um, I'll just cop to it myself. I won't drag Seahorn in it with me. But, um, but I sit there and, you know, you're going through take after take. And then you start to think like, uh, is this good? Is this right? Am I wrong? What's going on? You start drifting out of your brain and your body a little bit. And then you start having the worst thought in the world. Oh my God. Are Bob and Ray bored? Do they, do they pity me? Oh my God. They think I'm terrible, but they don't, they can't even believe they're friends with me anymore. And shit like that goes through your brain. And by the way, by the way, for all you actors out there, that's not helpful. And it's also not true. It doesn't help you get the work going on. So, uh, no, clearly I'm talking about that scene. So that scene was pretty emotional and, and a lot for me. To, oh, I'm sorry. You know? Yeah. That, that yeah. scene, that bathroom scene though, that was intense. Howard, he was broken. You know, he did, you never seen him look so bad. It looked like he'd been run over by a truck, hung over just the works. Yeah. Yeah. Really bad. Also, you know, I hated saying goodbye to Chuck when I clapped him out at the end of season three. Um, that was an, in, that was an instance where McKean and I, um, shot it in sequence. It just happened that it unfolded that day, that that day's events were from him coming in, uh, me giving him the check, me escorting him out, and then him escorting down the stairs and out the doors. And literally, that was the last I saw Michael McKean or Chuck uh, for months. Like we shot that scene, boom, and then he was done and he got in the car and he was wrapped and went and they stayed to shoot me and do some stuff. And then I didn't see him for like five months. So it really was like Chuck was dead to me. It was very interesting. And so there, I'm going, to keep, keep, I'm going to keep talking. So at the beginning of season four, Ray and Bob and I are together. And I think our first scene is outside of Chuck's house. And they did such a marvelous job of distressing it and, you know, and making it burned. And, um, you know, we spent a lot of time in that house and in that scene doing lots of, lots of really fun stuff. And, and that was when we, it dawned on us that one, Chuck was really dead. And then two, spoiler, Chuck's dead. And then two, um, that I wouldn't be working with Michael McKean again. Yeah, and I know. That really bumped me out because that was one of the true joys of being on the show, without a doubt. So, yeah, what a what a what a talent, eh? He cer certainly is. He certainly is. Well, I'm going to jump out of order for a sole reason because we're on a really good topic here about Michael McKean for a second. This was an email question that came into me. This is from Shannon Duncan. Uh, it's a two part question. She says, "Hi, Patrick. Love you. Love Howard. Adore the show." So, two questions. I've been rewatching Better Call Saul from the start to get ready for season six. I just watched The Cannery, season three, episode five, and noticed Howard wearing a wedding band. I'd never noticed one before, and I don't have knowledge of Howard being married. Is he? And the follow-up is, why is Howard so mean to Kim, especially in season two? Is there a history between them? Can't wait for the final season. And P.S. Hi, Eric. Big fan of you in the show. Thank you. So nice two couple questions. So sure. the, the first one, um, uh, Chicanery, so uh, Howard in the wedding ring. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, hi, Shannon. Thanks so much. And I think you're doing very smart work by rewatching. You're going to enjoy season six even more so by getting caught up to speed. Netflix drops season five, I think, April 4th. I'm a not sure about that. April 18th. No, 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 no. Oh. The premieres, but Netflix drops season five, I think, on April 4th. Yes, that you are correct on that. That's that is correct. Sorry, I misheard. Yeah. But chicanery, I do have a wedding band. And yes, I am married. And yes, I have. I, I, won't, I won't lie. Um, I have pitched uh, Beyonce as my uh, as my wife. Turns out she's been busy. And, uh, <laughs> she, um, but I pitch it every year. Uh, and you have not uh, seen my wife yet. Although uh, I think my wife influences me very much. Um, we'll find out. I've gotten that question a bunch of times. Actually, I've gotten that question from people who wondered if, if Howard was gay mm -hmm. and he was married. Um, which is a possibility, but not so much of a possibility, I don't think, in Albuquerque at that timeline in that position. Okay. I don't think the world was quite there, and probably not Albuquerque. Uh, maybe even not, not Albuquerque now, yeah. Uh, and why was I so mean to Kim? Hey, okay, guess what? I'm running a law firm, okay? And I need you to act like a lawyer. And if you're not going to do what I need you to do, you're going to get punished. I don't care if you are Kim Wexler. As a matter of fact, if I'm nicer to her than I am to other employees who would do the same mistakes, then I would be a bad head of a company. Um, 
was there a history behind us? Well, yes, in this, in the fact that like when she leaves HHM, I tell her, you know, basically I see her and myself. I think without a doubt, we were looking forward to seeing HHM and W. Yeah, Wexler added on top of that. The champion of Kim. I was a champion of Kim. And I think Howard's way of sort of, you know, uh, making up for not putting out his own shingle was bringing Kim up, making her a partner. But, you know, she left too soon. Yeah. I got a little defensive about that. I get that because sometimes I get a lot of questions about why was I mean to her. I don't think, well, you know what? I was hard. I'll give you that. Shannon, I'll give you that. I was hard on Kim Wexler. But you know what? Sometimes, as a parent, I know this. Yes. We are we are hard on those that we love and those that we know have infinite potential. Oh my gosh. Some of my kids are both going, ow, ow. I know, I know. And, and you know, you nailed it by saying that. And that's the thing too. You could feel sometimes that Howard did kind of feel in his gut, like, you know, I hate to do this, but I've got to be this way. And sometimes too, there was Chuck's, uh, you know, you know, uh, overshadowing the decisions too. I mean, you know, influencing a lot of Howard's, I won't say he was pu- puppeteering him, but without a doubt, I think I think uh, I think Howard very much suffered from the idea of could this firm be successful if Chuck wasn't here? Right. Mm-hmm. First, it's his dad's firm, but you know Chuck kind of made his dad. It sounds like as well, and then Chuck certainly was the brain factory for what was going on. But and I think that really undermined Howard in his competence, and so. I think you're right. He absolutely didn't like some of the stuff that he ended up doing, but I can't say he was unwilling because he did it. Yes, exactly. You can only go so far with saying like, well, Chuck made me do it. You're a grown ass man. You can do whatever you want. You're the H in HHM. So that stuff could have been put to bed a long time ago, which is why I think later on when there's therapy, uh, Howard is able to sort of untangle that. He does come to Namaste, which may seem funny, and of course, if you're putting Namaste on a Jaguar, I mean, there's there's certainly lots to talk about there. But at least he's putting it on there. Mm-hmm. And I got into a place where he can unravel that sort of thing that's going on, which all used to mean that, yes, I was hard on her, but no, not any harder than I should have been How about that. There you go. There you go. That's a great answer. And I think what we'll do, we're going to take a, se- a second here. There's great questions coming in. I've got audio questions from our members here as well, too. I've got two questions tonight. One is from our executive producer, Karina. So I'll start with hers and we'll follow up with one from Lori. So here's one uh, from Karina. And I think you'll like this one. Hi, Patrick. This is Karina. I know you are a huge Beatles fan. You said you were given all the original Beatles records by your aunts when you were six. Do you still have them? Also, what did you think of Get Back, the recent Beatles documentary? Um, I do still have them. They're in my front room right next to our baby grand piano. And the baby grand piano, uh, by the way, it's not like, oh, everyone in Hollywood has a baby grand piano. I have a piano teacher who ended up having uh, uh, two kids. And um, and as the kids got bigger, she realized her apartment was getting pretty small. So she started teaching on electric keyboards. And she goes, does anybody want us babysit my baby grand? for a little while. So it came up in our front room. So we get to that. The albums are right up there. Nice. uh, They still have the the magic marker circles on it from like Paul is cute and blacking out Ringo's eyes, stuff (laughs) like that. Um, And I I did see Get Back and uh, wow, what I was struck by was their youth. Mm -hmm. I was struck by, as I've gotten older listening to it. And also when I was young, they seemed older, right? Mm -hmm. But they're in in Amber, in those pictures, and I'm not sure what, what is what. And But the notion that when you're watching that, that Yoko Ono is the oldest and she's 35. Yeah. The oldest the Beatles are, I think, is 28 at that point. And that's at the end of all they have written. That's what still staggers me whenever I feel, when you think about genius and all those sort of things that go on, it's like, wow, they were young men and young people are sort of crazy and unfocused. And yet they were there at the end of their twenties, still doing that. And I mean, the magic and the banality of watching Paul just sort of come up with songs and seeing Ringo and, and George yawn, just be sort of bored. Yep. It also reminded me this, it echoed very much when I, uh, when I saw uh, the Eagles six hour documentary, which is also worth watching. Um, it's hard work. Yeah. Yes. He wakes up in the middle of the night and dreams scrambled eggs and writes down yesterday. Maybe Keith Richards came up with Black Brown Sugar's riff 
uh, in a dream. That's great. But after that, after that comes hard work and watching that. And if you watch all of that, you're like, oh yeah, it takes time. It's still genius and it's still beautiful, but don't tell me it's not craft. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. That was a good documentary. I watched it as well too. It's, it's almost like watching Star Wars the first time when, it, when all the series ends, you're like, oh my God, you want more. And it was just so amazing. Um, or better call Saul, when it comes to an end, we're going to want more. But it's just amazing to see the things come to life by accident. You know, strumming, 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 all of a sudden, oh my God, that's it. That's how it came to life. Just amazing, right? But it is, it's inspiring to see and it's exciting. And, and I, you know, I, uh, I had my kids watch it for a while. They're 9 and 11. They play piano and they play little stuff. But of course, of course, it's, it's not their music. They do know Beatles music. My daughter's named after Abbey Road. She's spelled A B B E Y. Thanks, Dad. Nice, Good. nice. Life, right? But, um, and they like the music because they've heard it and they know the words. And they saw McCartney when he came uh, to uh, Dodger Stadium the last tour around. And, but I can't make them have the same emotional hook. Like when I got these when I was 12, well, why? Because, you know, I'm, I'm an older man. Right. And younger generation. So my, my best hope is that I can foister, uh, uh, foster and foist a, uh, an appreciation of the music onto them, expose them to it and hope the hooks and the music can do itself. But to have them sit in one six hours of them noodling. Yeah. They're not- no, it's beyond that. Yeah. Well, your daughters are lucky as well, too. I mean, you could have been into Frank Zappa and not the Beatles. And, you know, the names could have been a little different, right? You know? Yeah. yeah. yeah so, yeah, there's that. All right. I'm going to come over to Lori's question. We're going to jump back to some Super Chat questions as well. So here's another audio question from Lori. Hi there, Patrick. This is Lori. I'd like to thank you for being a guest on the show tonight and for all the kindness that you've shown to your fans. It really does mean a lot to us. I have some questions for you, please. How much was your life affected when you first became a spokesman for Bell & Health and lovingly referred to as the Bell & Guy? Also, how cool was it meeting Jordy Nelson for the first time? Thanks so much. Well, I suspect, is it Caroline? Is that what I heard? Uh, Lori. Lori, Lori, Uh, pardon me. Yep. May or, maybe from Wisconsin is what I'm thinking. Uh, I love being called the Bellin guy. You know, I had that gig for about what she's referring to is there's a hospital in Green Bay, Wisconsin called Bellin, Bellin Health. Um, and welcome to Bellin Health. And I got that job as a spokesman for them. And it was almost a 10 year gig. Um, I would do all these radio spots. I got to all these live spots. I got to go to Green Bay. I got to go watch games at Lambeau Field because Bellin Health was the sponsor of the Packers. Jordy Nelson was so nice. I have his jersey upstairs that he signed for me. I mean, that's one of those weird, crazy things of uh, you find yourself in situations all because you wanted to be an actor. Uh, I find myself in Lambeau Field, on the field, standing uh, next to, uh, oh my gosh, the field goal kicker. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. He was my fantasy football kick, field, field kicker. And, uh, and we're standing there and you know, it's, it, they're warming up and stuff like that. And I thought, what am I doing? What am I doing? on the field at Lambeau. And it's all because I'm doing, you know, this. Uh, I got to meet Bart Starr. I got to meet Paul Horning. I got to meet Brett Favre and, and his wife, uh, the Bell and Run, the 5K they have every year. I got to lead that one year. Uh, and it, it exposed me to, to Wisconsin in a great way. I have such a, such a big heart in, uh, for, for Green Bay, both in the winter and in the summer. In the summer is actually kind of ungodly hot in August. She can attest to that. Um, but I don't do that anymore. I haven't done it in a couple of years, which is too bad. Um, I would, I, I told them as I get older, you know, I can be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the bell on guy. Got to go get my prostate exam, right? Come on. There's <laughs> a whole live stream, like getting my teeth cleaned or something. Yep. I don't know. That's awesome. Well, good question. Thank you, Lori. And thank you, Karina, as well, too. Good questions for sure. Here's a super chat question that came in from Rogava. Rogava says, what's a one-liner that would suit Howard? For example, Jimmy always finds the shortest distance between two points, Nacho wouldn't squash a bug with a sledgehammer or another note or on another note. When will we visit Fr- uh, France again? Mm, what would Howard's line be? I mean, he's got, he's got the Charlie hustle a lot, but I mean, is there something else to you? Um, something else you could think of a one-liner? Well, you know, you're talking about the one-liner that he says, like a catchphrase. Yeah. Or- yeah. Wow. You know, um, Boy. Or maybe and one that would he actually says that could, that could suit him. So maybe it's nothing something that he says, but a one-liner that could suit Howard. Oh, in that case, I think it would be something like this: 
Thank you very much. I value your opinion. I'll get back to you on that. I like that. I do like that. Yeah. Yeah. There was, there was something that uh, Howard had said similar to that. It was to Kim. I think it was, I forget the exact line. There was something like that. And then pushing me to do something. Uh, what was that? She came in and I'm just like, I, you know, I got this. Thanks very much. Yeah. I think I, thanks very much. And it's the idea of like, you know, I'm still behind the desk and that's, and that's sort of gone through from the beginning. I've always tried to imagine. And I think Vincent Peter also dropped that into my brain early on that, um, you're the guy behind the desk. You're Howard Hamlin, and they are not. And I always felt that again, going back to Jen Bryan in those suits, those suits are awesome because I always had like my, my, my wonderful sort of dirty secret in my brain uh, was when I walked into the room, Howard and also the actor, I would always be like, when I'd walk in, I'm like, my suit is more expensive than everybody's clothing combined. And it was a point of pride and a point of power. I think it was, it was top dog sort of thing. So when you see Howard, I think, I think the phrase has been um, with a stick up his ass. That's one way to look at it. And the other way I look at it is that he just stands tall because his clothing is so good. Perfect. Perfect. Here, here's a good one coming for all the way from over in Germany from our friend Andrea. It's very late over there. It's got to be probably about three or four o'clock in the morning over there. She says, and this is a good question. If you could choose as Howard, who would you save if his or her life was in danger? Kim, Jimmy, or yourself? That's a I good would like to Kim. Jimmy, no, sorry. I've already saved him too many times, man. No. Um, I would like to think Howard... And I have to keep saying, I would like to think Howard would save Kim, but I can't be sure. Mm, yeah. <laughs> until you are in a situation where you're asked, like, what are your beliefs on this? And what your beliefs on that? You say something now until you are in that situation. You never know, right? You just don't. Right. So. But by, are there people witnessing? Is yeah. that the sort of thing, if people were witnessing, is it the sort of thing that would drive you to sacrifice yourself? Yeah. Is that enough to do the right choice? If it is the right choice, and that's a debate. Mm -hmm. It's also, I would like to think Howard would do the right thing, whatever that is. Yeah, yeah, that's a given. Good question, Andrea. This is a question from Price of Reason. Do people stop you on the street and ask uh, for a lot of spoilers? Um, people sometimes will say, uh, they'll, they'll be like, hey, so is Walter White coming in episode two or three this season? That's <laughs> been going on one, by the way. Um, no, mostly what I get is what, uh, I forget who was the young lady, uh, Shannon, I think mostly what I get is like, Hey, why are you so mean to Kim? Get off her back. I was in New York city once. I think it was like two, three years ago, was three years ago. We we're there doing some press for the show. And I was walking through central park and there was a, this is so New York, there's a jogger and he's jogging and he sees me. He goes, Hey, Howard. And I'm like, Hey, yeah. He goes, he goes, love the show. Get off Kim's ass, all right? Doesn't miss a beat, doesn't break stride, and keeps going. And I was like, well, "That's New York for you, right there." That is hilarious. Yeah, it's amazing sometimes how people get they think that they're the actual character twenty four seven, you know. But it's cool though. That shows how invest, invested in the show that they are. It always makes me happy when people have an opinion. Yes, I know. I know. Now, you've had the opportunity a couple times this season, our, our good friend Tom Schnauz, co-host here as well. He wrote a couple doozies this season, so you've had a chance to work with him. He started this thing. You're new to this. He started this thing way back when he was on the show here. Um, he determined that there is a smell in the Gilliverse, okay? So this Gilliverse that we go to, we take off in this rocket ship every Friday night. We go there, and when we get there to wherever we are, there's a smell, and it smells like two things. It smells like this and this. All right, so we've asked pretty much every single guest that's come on the show. Uh, there's a there's a right answer. Vince got it half right. So, in your imagination, what do you think it smells like? This and this in the Gilliverse, and I'll tell you if you're right or wrong. In the Gilliverse, mm -hmm. it smells like um, stevia. Mm. I don't know. I was trying to think of Kim wears a perfume, but she doesn't wear perfume. She can't afford perfume. <laughs> well, so oh. far in the first one. Oh. And uh, you can go. And do you want to go with perfume? You want to try one more answer? Think, think of something. Think of something that Tom likes and not harassing people. That doesn't count. <laughs> 
Um, what is Tom? I, 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 I can't figure out this question. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a hint. It's a food group. It's Tom's only food group. His only food group. Yep. Good. And us, uh, us, us here in Canada like it a lot too. I'm really going on a limb to help you on this one. Poutine. You're close. Bacon. Mm. Bacon and fear is the correct answer. Tell him what he's won, Alex. Fear. Oh, I say that like I would have guessed that. I would have never. <laughs> okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, from Robert uh, Kirkendall, if I'm pronouncing it right, have you built a backstory for Howard, uh, especially when with regards to his father? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I did. You know, I, I asked them a couple of times about that sort of idea. But the fact is, you know, these writers write to where the story is going, whether it's back or forwards. And uh, part of me thought, well, if it was important for me to have super big details about that, they would be writing that for me. There would be a scene that would be reflective of that. Uh, to the young lady's point that I have a ring on. Well, I'm married, but we haven't felt the need to show a wife. Why is that? Well, that's because it's not servicing the story at hand. What is the story to hand? So then it's my job as an actor to go like, well, I am married. Am I a good husband? Am I a bad husband? How long have I been married? And I can make up those answers for myself. Same thing with the father. Now they give me clues along the way. One, he's not there. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, unless some nefarious end or abandon his children, which also is not scripturally uh, supported, then I can only assume since I'm of a certain age, that my father is dead. My mother never gets mentioned. I never talk about my parents. I only mention my father. So what's that mean? Well, it can mean I can make up whatever I want. Does it inform how I live and how I do? Well, if I want to keep my mother alive somewhere, we just don't talk about her in the show, then that makes me a guy who's maybe a doting son who either calls her every week and sends her money, and therefore that informs how I am being married, which means I'm a certain type of person in a country club who maybe doesn't curse, swear, or steal money. Well, I don't steal. I'm not a stealer. I know that because I run my business like that. Where did I learn that from? Maybe from my father. Maybe I admire my, oh, maybe I'm one of those kids who wanted to be something different, but then his father drug him in, and then his father died, and everybody around him said, what a great man he was, and then you're stuck with feeling shitty about yourself if you ever have a bad thought about your dad which is, by the way, not correct. And maybe during therapy in season five or four, that's where Howard all of a sudden unravels that and goes like, oh, oh, it's okay to say I, I, I didn't want to do this, but here I am and I can accept things. And maybe I put namaste on my plates to feel good about that. So that's how my brain works on that. But there's nothing in the script that says anything about him and Vince and Peter and none of the writers that includes Tom ever suggested anything otherwise. Well, sometimes I think not knowing is great too, because a lot of times people ask for some of these stories of like what's Gus Fring's backstory and Chile and, and things like that. And because we, and we might see some of that, that'd be kind of cool in season six, but, uh, and I don't know that, but um, sometimes not knowing is good. You know, you, we get to hypothesize ourselves. Everyone has a different opinion and it makes us like or love or hate the character, uh, whoever the character may be. So I think not knowing sometimes is good. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You don't need to know everything all the time. Again, we are shining a light on this broad story, and there's a shaft of light that is telling this, this bit. Mm -hmm. And genius, I think, of the writing staff uh, is that they managed to illuminate little shards here and there as well that pique our interest, both backwards and forwards, as the main shaft keeps moving along. And I think that's what keeps both the actors and the audience on their toes. Agreed. Agreed. And then we've got not only that brilliant writing, brilliant acting, and then the musical undertones that we have, that character is built into these shows as well, too. Just beautiful. I mean, you're being led by every hand like through this story. It's just amazing. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you, look, I'll speak again just for myself and I won't drag Seahorn into it and throw her under the bus. But sometimes actors think that the, the performance, that the show begins and ends with when they open their mouths, they shut their mouths. You know what I mean? And then you go and see it and you're like, oh my God, I remember the first time seeing it on the big screen. I was like, the show's going on and it's unspooling. And all of a sudden I, I'm on the show and I, and I go, oh my God, I'm in this. I mean, I was so thrilled because, because everything is attended to. And that music, mm. that's everything. It is. It's too heavy handed. It's some of the most beautiful scoring that there is on television ever, I think. Did you ever foresee being well, through six seasons? Did you ever see, like when you got the gig, and I don't think I ever asked you last time about the audition process. So maybe tell us about that. And did you foresee being uh, on here this long, like your character? No, no, I did not. And, and, you know, every year I was like, well, that was fun. That's over. 
I think and part of it was because of the notion of like, we never saw me in Breaking Bad, you know, and that sort of thing. And I wasn't, you know, I don't know, because every actor assumes that they're getting fired at the end of the day, or at least this one does. And, uh, you know, it's like, oh, I had a great time. Thanks for the Christmas fleece. See y'all. Bye. <laughs> you know. Um, but in the end, uh, you know, uh, the writers write to where they said the story was taking them. That was always sort of the, the, the promise. Um, but an example, I believe, is, you know, once they got Michael McKean involved, the idea that they had of what the brother was going to be, I think they've spoken to it before that they thought it would be maybe an episode or it, wouldn't, it was going to be a brief sort of interlude. But then they got the town of Michael McKean on board and they're like, oh, oh, this is going this is going places we weren't sure. And things got elongated and suspended. And, you know, um, I was fortunate to keep going along. You know, I was, uh, you know, a uh, part of the, the landscape of what's going on. And let's face it, they need, Better Call of Saul needs a couple of people who don't have guns. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And I mean, really, uh, the character of Howard, like, I mean, I love Howard and dislike Howard at the same time so many times. I mean, I, and I and I know you as a person. So, I mean, it's it's easy to separate, you know, the, the two. Uh, it, but the character is so good and he's such a good anchor for Kim in between Jimmy. And, you know, he's a good, it's a good character, a really good character. I'm glad to see that he's, you have lasted throughout the whole thing. And I'm really looking forward to seeing your work in, in uh, this season. And I'm going to lead into another question that kind of talks about this season. Uh, this is from LD Sniper it says, love you on better call Saul. In my opinion, you're the most underrated character. Awesome. Uh, and what did you think of the season six trailer? You were, you shared it really quickly when it came out. We all saw that. Oh man, um, I, you know, I was sort of gobsmacked because it's just, again, we talked about this before, but it's it, it, the attention to detail, those shots, every shot in that trailer is like a film school class. Yeah. Like, this is how you, this is called composition. This is lighting. This is how you move a camera. It's just all great. And they ended together such a great trailer. Just it, we've been shooting this season for you know a year, and uh, it was great to be reminded of some things that we had shot almost a year ago. You know, things I'd sort of forgotten, and you go like, "How could you forget that?" Well, because you know life intrudes and all that sort of thing, and then all of a sudden you're Whoa! the trailer brought me back to all of it, and it brought me back to the excitement of. You know, we've all been laid off and COVID and all of this stuff has, has interrupted us in life in general. And there's many, 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 many things that are going on that sort of emotionally drain from us. But there's been almost a two year layoff between five and six. And now in one big burst, five is going to drop on Netflix and, and we get two episodes on the 18th. And we're going to run six weeks in a row, take a quick break. Wow. Another six. And then it's all over. So like in the next four or five months. It's all going to come to a crashing halt, and uh, and the trailer reminded me of that, and I got very excited about it. Yeah, probably bittersweet. That's the thing. I had a question to ask you about that, but you've, you've answered it. The fact that everything was on hiatus, you guys didn't know when you're going to work again, or if you if we're going to even finish this season. You know, we didn't uh, didn't know, and Tom and everyone was talking about it was paramount that. The look did not change of the show because the actors and cast and crew had to work differently, different circumstances. So the tone had to still feel the same. Uh, when are we going to get back to work? Some people started getting back to work in other shows and some of the you know cast crew were watching how they did things. They've adopted some things for Better Call Saul. Everyone goes back to work. That boom, we're here with a trailer and it's screeching to a halt. That's kind of scary too, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, part of, part of the fun of being on set is the fun of being on set mm -hmm. and for people who also, you know, work in certain offices, there is a, there's the, the fun coffee area or the kitchen, you know, in, in, in uh, sets, you, you go to craft services or you go hang out in hair and makeup. Hair and makeup was a great place to start the day. It was a collection and a clutch. You'd all get in there and you put on some music and coffee and get chatty and do your work and start doing lines. And it was a great place to shape your head. COVID changed all that. It was one at a time, everyone's masked up. It became a much more quiet space. And then working through the set, you just, you couldn't be chatty and you couldn't be, uh, uh, you couldn't be as friendly in, in some respects. And uh, having that map, then by the way, I had it easy. I had it easy. I could be in my trailer because they didn't want me anywhere else. I could have my mask off. Then I put my mask on and I would go and we'd rehearse and then we'd line it up and then I'd go away. Mm -hmm. And I come 
And but the crew, God bless that crew. That, and that means all the crew who's been working through this. And that's still sort of the standard practice right now. Crew is masked up. And um, I can't imagine doing that for 12 and 13, 14 and 16 hours a day, having that mask on and, uh, and doing that. And, uh, you know, filming, just the communication alone is so hard because now you, what'd you say? What'd you say? Yeah, you can't read lips and. Yeah, it took a while. It took a while to sort of like figure it all out. But everybody got good about it. Everybody got good. We figured out a new way of working. Uh, that's all. And, and by the way, we weren't the only show that had to adapt like that. And, uh, and so you just you were blessed that you had a job to go to and you figured out what you needed to do to get it done. That's well, wa- watching that trailer, you'd never know it was filmed during a pandemic. You know, they, I mean, nothing changed. So their, their goal of the tone and the feel, they nailed it. They nailed it. And, you know, to sound very unselfish for a moment, I know a lot of us are really sad. Like we're excited to see this come in a couple of weeks, few weeks from now. Um, but we're going to be very sad when the final curtain rolls in episode 13, but to take our feelings away from it, a lot of people probably don't realize what you talk about being on set and the conversations around the water cooler and the makeup and everything, craft services. It's not going to be easy for all of you either. You know, when it, when that final day comes and the final one's done, you know, so, you know, a uh, hats off to all the men and women that do what they do and the family that's been built. It's quite the family. Oh, absolutely. And there's some people crew wise who have been there since Breaking Bad. Yeah. They've been there for the whole ride. That's like 10 years out of their lives, even more. And that's a long, long time with the same sort of the same folks and the same faces. And I've been there seven years. You know, I, I, I've been doing it for seven years. And so there was that sense of as uh, as things were coming to a close and people started, it, it was it was like high school. Right. Yeah. It's your high school and it's it's February in high school. And now you're like, oh, did you get your, your notice? Where are you going to school? What are you doing for summer? And all those questions start coming. What are you doing next? What are you doing next? And implied with that is you won't be doing this again. Yeah. Yeah. Taco stand. Is this the last time we're going to watch the sunset at Sandia? Oh, is this our last time on this set? Well, I don't know. I don't know what the next uh, script is. But then you start to worry. Is this the last time I'm on this set? Because then, I mean, it's show business. It's a business. Yeah. You're sentimental about. Yeah. Drop it up, up, slide it in. That's money, baby. You know, and, and that is the, the, the nature of the beast. Um, but as we, as we started wrapping up this season, uh, Bob said it best. Bob said it best at one point. He said, Hey man, we don't have to be sad. We did it all. We did it all. We had parties. We hiked. Uh, we had big things. We had small things. We made friends. We, we got involved in Albuquerque and in each other. We rescued dogs. We lived together. Uh, what else are you supposed to do? What else are you supposed to do? There was no stone left unturned, I think, of our experience of doing it. And, uh, and I was glad he said it because it helped articulate and sort of flip it on. A, it, instead of being like maudlin about like, oh, no, it's all over. It's like, oh, no, man. What an experience. I checked off every box I could have. The bucket no list regret. was bucket list was complete. Yeah. That's awesome. That's very well said. That's a very, very touching story for sure. And I think they could all say the same thing, but Bob said it very well. Yeah. I'm sure he spoke for everyone by saying that. Yeah. Here's a good question from Zoko Santos. We talked earlier briefly about, you know, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have a suit to take home or the Jaguar? Was there, uh, he says, um, was there one thing you were able to take on your last day of filming? Like other than maybe a paycheck or something like that, you know? Well, um, yes, I got the only actual pen that was embossed with HHM. No way. Only ever made one and properties, uh uh-oh properties let me have it so that's great i'm not giving it back <laughs> good good yeah that's good awesome that's really yeah. really cool yeah i was and i was actually thrilled with it they were like hey we only made one we'd like you to have it and mm. i was like Can you imagine, imagine your kids doing homework you come home they're chewing on it like kids do you know chewing a pen you know <laughs> no <laughs> no um this is from uh girly girl life adventures the writers are highly regarded as one of the best writing teams there ever was. Uh, however, did you have any influence on Howard's character development? Good question. Uh, it's a great question. One, I agree with you. These are some of the best writers ever uh, assembled, without a doubt. And uh, it's because of their attention to detail and 
you know, the fish stinks from the head down. Vince and Peter are wonderful, great writers. And uh, everybody who works with them is influenced by them. I would not begin to tell them what I think they ought to write for me. I'm a, I'm a very good actor. I will, I will I'll allow my ego that. Uh, but I also know that I'm only as good as the writing and the writing has been stellar. And so if they write something, I look at it as being uh, just the right amount of words for me to get what needs to be gotten out of that scene. Now, if I have questions, that's okay. Then you can go to the writer and the director of the episode and say like, hey, uh, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm confused about this area. I, I need clarity. I'm thinking it's like this. And sometimes they're like, oh, no, 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 no. It's not like this, it's like that. And they go, oh. And then I'll back up, but I can almost guarantee you anytime I've been like, well, wouldn't it, been, wouldn't it be better if I said anytime that thoughts in here or that, that starts to come out of me in any way, shape or form, um, they can almost always to go like, well, yeah, that would be true, except here on page four, you say this and you go, oh, because the great news about them is that good writers and great writers like these guys and girls, um, they see the totality of what's going on. They also have an idea of maybe where it's going. But what I loved about this is that it was an unfolded week to week for me as an actor. I never knew it was coming up ahead. And I like that because it keeps you uh, in the moment. It only gives you the lattice work of what has happened before in order to sort of deal with now. For me, nothing's worse than if they would have told me uh, what's going on at the end of season five, at the beginning of season five, or any of those seasons. I really enjoyed just sort of getting the script dropped and then just going to work a couple of days later. For me, it made it fresh. Well, I agree. You are a fantastic actor. You're one of my favorite actors. And I think with Howard, anytime he's on screen, he pulls you in. And whether you want to be part of that conversation or not, you are. Um, and he's, he's uh, like a, I think he's like a quarterback. I think he's a quarterback in a lot of the scenes. You know, I mean, you just can't have that. I mean, you might have someone grabbing that touchdown at the same time, too. But, I mean, you are the quarterback. And you do a f fantastic job, and I'm very happy to see you go all the way through. And I really can't wait to see what season six holds for Howard. I, I have a feeling he's in some trouble. Uh, you know, uh, um, <laughs> we won't. We won't. I, I don't know. That's only if you think you know uh, Kim and, and Jimmy are, are are capable. They just may be clowns. You know yeah. What I'm saying? Yep. It's gonna be great. I, judging from that trailer, I it feels like a lot of us watch the trailer for the first time, and we're, we're kind of out of breath. Um, and I, I feel it's the intensity like that we saw on a regular basis in Breaking Bad with the, and I hear, hear again too, we never ask questions in the, in the future about what's going to happen. We're not, we never ask you for spoilers or anything like that. And this is not even going in that territory, but would you feel the intensity level of this season is something we've never seen before on Better Call Saul? Oh, I, th I think so. And I'm not speaking out of school. Bob has talked about that as well, about the idea of like Better Call Saul start. It's funny, you know, we ended operatically with the end of Breaking Bad. It, it, I mean, literally operatic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's no way Saul can come in at that level, nor should it, right? It's a different story, telling at a different pace, doing its different things. And But those explorations, it's like all these snowballs that started up on the hill in season one are now getting bigger and bigger. And, and I think the trailer really touches on the idea of Things have been put into motion that naturally have to have some sort of consequence. And those consequences and those stakes have meticulously been built over five seasons. And so therefore, um, you know, stuff's happening in the trailer. Guns are being fired. People are running. I love the shot of Kim's foot going. Yeah, I know. Hypertension. A jackhammer. Oh. I love it of my brain i'm like there that's the season right there if you're gonna take a still frame <laughs> i love that uh, down to our last couple questions here this is from our moderator renata she says um i worked with your wife in new york city at the hard rock cafe in the early 90s uh sweet as can be and you picked a good one just saying oh uh, you know what i it's it's the best question i ever asked and the best answer i ever got without a doubt my life really started when i met mandy and, uh, and now we've got two beautiful kids, two dogs. And we, we, you know what? She, Renata, she just finished her first feature written and directed by her. We shot it during COVID and it's called Just Plus None. And if you go to MandyFabian.com or you follow Mandy at MandyFabian on Twitter, you'll see more. And also I'll be promoting as well because I was the executive producer. 
which sounds fancy, but all that means is that I made coffee and took a lot of selfies with the cats. So. <laughs> that's fan- that's fantastic. She talks about singing at the Hard Rock all the time. She tells great stories of doing that. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And a moment ago, this is one of the opportunities where I love when I can switch a camera where people don't see me on the camera because I was about to read another question and I laughed. I really laughed. This is a funny question. Um, this is, and this is the last one for the evening. Um, this is from Josh Gordon. Josh is one of our regulars. And Josh says, does Howard consider himself lucky because he had bowling balls on his car and not a Chicago sunroof? (laughs) (laughs) Knew what a Chicago sunroof was. He would, he would blanch. He'd never stop throwing up most likely. Uh, I think the bowling ball, although, but the bowling ball is such an offensive thing, right? (laughs) It's such it's such an affront. It's a bowling ball. People who own Jaguars don't go bowling. Nope. I mean, it's like a triple, a triple awfulness. That was a fun night to watch that happen though. And you know, it was so funny too seeing that scene setting it up. And I can just imagine what they went through when, when uh, Bob's in the, uh, the pawn shop there or whatever, looking at everything, he's picking up blenders and he's picking up this, he's trying to feel the weight, like just the different things that he was considering throwing. And then the bowling balls was it. It worked out perfect. Worked out perfect. And I have to say, you know, that's a nice shoot. We're doing that. And I think, uh, I think Gordon was directing that. And, um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, props, they had to figure out like they had a catapult and they had the car taped out. Boom. They kept practicing it, practicing it because I know it's a TV show, but we don't have unlimited supplies of vintage Jaguars. Uh, you yeah. know? They pull that in. They Are we on the mark? We're on the mark. Also, they're like, they want to have make sure I'm up there. You know, you don't want anything to go wrong in this. And so, it, you know. Props to props and everybody on the crew who made that shot work. So it was a physical catapult? Oh, yeah. Well, wow. Very cool. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that. Well, here at the end of the hour here, I want to give you the opportunity as well to, um, because this is probably one of the last times I get to talk to Gilvers. Maybe we'll catch back up towards the end of the season. We'll circle back and have a few few of you guys on together. It would be really nice. A little party, wrap-up party. But um, would you like to take a moment just to see, you know, say anything to your fellow colleagues that, that are out there and what it's been like working throughout this entire wonderful season? And as you wrap up, just, uh, you know, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, you know, uh, first of all, thank you for the thank you for Into the Guild first. I mean, uh, that is just a testimony to uh, to the shows and what Vince Gilligan has created, which is I'm just thrilled to have been a part of. I'm going to miss working with my friends and colleagues so much because they really have become family. Um, but, uh, I, like I said, uh, I flip that coin and go like, what an experience, what, what a great opportunity to check all those boxes in, in doing this. And I look forward to the next adventure, but mostly I want to thank everybody who's watched the show, continues to watch the show and enjoys the show and, and lets us know because, uh, you know, my dream has literally come true by being a part of something like this. And that doesn't happen, uh, one-sided. It only happens if people tune in. So thank you all. And thank you all for being like the best fans in the world. I know other shows say that, but they're wrong. You guys are. <laughs> awesome, man. Uh, fantastic work. And I mean, you've been just a champion on the show. We love you. The fans love you. Um, I'm again, I know I've said this 10 times today, but I'm looking forward to seeing this. I can't wait. It's going to be, uh, Oh, I, I want it to be here and I don't want it to be here because once it starts, it's that, that train we can't stop, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, no, I- you will not be disappointed. Good. That I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that. And speaking of doing some thanks as well, too, and I have to make notes as well, too, because I will forget. I have a very bad short-term memory. I just want to say thank you to a few people. First and foremost, thank you to you for coming on the show when uh, my channel was a small little channel, still is small, but back in Rock Shop Live, you took a chance and come on. We had fun, and thank you for returning, so I appreciate that. And uh, I appreciate the friendship we've, we've built out of it. So thank you, Patrick. And thank you to your family, too, for taking the time to have you do this. Uh, a big, huge thank you to our sponsors, uh, Warren and Rachel at bobbleheads.com. Check out all the Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul bobbleheads at bobbleheads.com. Massive thanks to our executive producer, Karina. She's in the chat as well right now. And her incredible moderator team, consisting of Eamon, Jen, and Renata. We want to thank everybody. Uh, I want to thank our channel members, our Patreon supporters, our YouTube subscribers. Uh, we just hit 20,000 subs a few days or a week ago, whatever. So thank you for that. And if you're new here tonight, please consider hitting that subscribe button down below. And I do promise to work just as hard to keep you as a subscriber as I did to get you. So everybody, um, season five is coming to Netflix right away. Season six starts April 18th with two back-to-back on the, would it be the Monday and the Tuesday? Is that how it works? 
Uh, I think oh. I think that's usually how they do it. Or are they going to two in one night? I think it's back to back. I think each night. I think you probably know better than me. I think so, but I, that's what it was in the past. But I'm not positive on that. We'll be taking a short break in the middle and then back for the. Uh, Ooh, the last part of season six of Better Call Saul. So stay tuned for some more guests coming up. We're going to have some fun ones coming up. We might have a special dual guest coming up for the f- last show before the premiere. So before the 18th, we'll stay tuned for that. And uh, just watch for details on all of our social media. Patrick, I'll say goodbye to you off the air. Everyone, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be back and uh, hang out with you on a Friday night. And we'll be getting Tom back soon as well, too. We might be doing them on Thursdays because Tom has some Friday commitments. So they might be Thursdays, but stay tuned for a notice. Everyone, see you real soon. And until next time, cheers. Thanks again for tuning in to Inside the Gilliverse with Eric Broadbent. Be sure to check back each week for more great discussions and interviews with cast and crew from Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. Please like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends.